recorded. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pause for a moment of silence so that we can exercise 1 John 1, 9, also known as the rebound technique, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do this, of course, so that we can restore the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. He is our tutor. He is the one who guides. He is the one who empowers. And he is the one who illuminates truth as we engage in his word. So for now, let's just pause for a moment of silence and pray and confess and name any sins that we might have. And then I'll open with prayer. Let us pray. Father, thank you uh, for this opportunity to assemble together with the believers in Christ. We know, Lord, that we are running out of time. Time is of the essence. And so we're doing everything we can to advance the cause of Christ and to expose people to biblical truth because that is the order of the day today is a day of salvation and so we trust father that as we continue to assemble together we would not do it in vain we would do it because we want to honor you we want to know you more and more each and every day especially as we assemble together as a local body of jesus christ and so now father having named our sins to you we ask, Father, that God, the Holy Spirit, would be the one to take over and speak through me as I illuminate the truths regarding evil. Evil is distinct from sin. Sin is not evil, and evil may not be sin. So as we move through this particular subject, I pray that we would be at our best attention, focusing on the information so that when we're out and about by ourselves, Without the assembly next to us, while we're by ourselves, we would be able to recall these truths so that we can make application where necessary. I thank you, Father, for everyone that continues to assemble together, knowing, Father, that this brings you honor and glory because we're placing a high uh, priority on your word as you have told us in Psalms 138 to yourself that uh, you elevate doctrine even above your name. And as such, we ought to do likewise. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. What a privilege it is to gather together safely uh, so that we can know you more through holy word. And we ask this in Christ's matchless name. Amen. So before we look at the slides in front of us, I want to kind of review just a little bit I'm just going to call them out. I'm not going to bring the slides up. I'm just going to bring to remembrance the things that we have covered thus far, because this is increment four, BBD number four, basic Bible doctrine number four, increment four. And my plan is to put this together and to create a maybe an ebook of some sort and then even expand on it a little bit more on each of the doctrines that we've covered. These are truths that we must be familiar with. Um, one of the things that I have heard throughout the years in my 30 plus years of ministry is that the average Christian could get twisted up into a doctrinal pretzel when some JW or Mormon would come and knock on the door. So we ought to be ready to answer when asked why we believe what we believe. The cults do it, and likewise we should, because we have the truth. And so it is imperative that we know these truths. And so you'll recall <clears throat> that I've been kind of detailing this as what Church of Hope is all about, what a doctrinal church looks like, what a Bible teaching church, church looks like. And remember, I talked about how my approach to the word of God, how I come up with these nuggets of truth 
is to an ice method, the acrostic ice. Remember what that was? I-C-E, isagogics, categories, exegesis. That's how I delve into the word of God. I just don't read it. There is an, a scientific approach. There is a hermeneutical approach to getting into the text. Unlike these other people who are behind the pulpits, many of them who may not have any kind of formal training, they just kind of read it and they think, they understand it. Uh, the Holy Spirit told me there is a method to the madness. So remember, isagogics, it takes into relation the literary and external history of the Bible so that a book's cultural, social, and political and religious setting may be interpreted in view of the time in which it was written. And so I take everything into consideration, the culture, the time of the day, the dispensation. Was it written for Israel? Israel or was it written for the church? Was it written to the disciples only or was it written for us? Those things are important. Otherwise, you're going to get confused on truths that may be mentioned and plastered on a uh, billboard, which have no bearing on us today. Or So that's why it's important that you go through it in an isagogical way, you going through categories and going through hardcore exegesis where you go into the text and pull out from the text. It's using the grammatical, syntactical, etymological, and contextual analysis of the scriptural passage on a word-by-word -word basis. This is why sometimes you'll recall and you'll, you'll see how I take the time and revisit the same verses that we've looked at in the past only to find out there's another kernel of truth there that might help amplify its meaning. And I take the command of Jesus seriously, and I hope that you do too. When Jesus was warring with the devil, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word means every word. And so we have to take the time and study it closely. So there's categories, there's the exegesis. And then, of course, I've talked about how in Ephesians 4, it talks about my job as the pastor is to empower, to influence, to teach you all so that you can do the work of the ministry, Ephesians 4.11. So regardless of distance, no matter how many miles we are apart from each other, if you're guarding biblical truth, if you're guarding the word of God and God is being honored and the cross is lifted, he is going to ensure that we have a place to pull together, study together, because his name is exalted above all things. He must be preeminent in our lives. And we're seeing this spiraling downward, this degradation all around the world today. And I was just talking to someone recently about a the mental health is just spiraling downwards. A lot of people, I spoke to someone overseas. He was telling me that um, several of the people that he knows have checked out to go into a mental health institution. They are depressed. And, so, and one of them said, if they can have a Bible study with me online. I said, sure, you know, maybe we could do 30 minutes a day, twice a week or something like that. But these are people who can't cope. They're overseas. They're deployed. They can't focus. And they can't seem to concentrate on basic life. And we have the remedy. We have the solution. And it's Bible doctrine. And that's why it, it pains me sometimes. I have to argue with some of the believers that I know who sometimes say, again, this? Yes, this. That what else is there? What else is there? Unless you just want to be tickled, you want your ears tickled. Church of Hope is not a place, it's not a social gathering, it's not a social group. It's a place to be taught the word of God. It will always be like that. That's the mainstay of Church of Hope. If not, we might as well dissolve it because I started it under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, his leading, that this must be a place where it'll be a beacon of light to those around the world who are wanting to know God more. And you and I, every one of you in the chairs right now, have an opportunity to pull together and fellowship and learn these kernels of truth so that you can 
commit it to memory and apply it to life. Minister to the people around you. I guarantee you someone is hurting out there that needs comforting, needs encouragement. It just doesn't know how to deal with life. They don't know how to pray, for example. All of that is privy to the believer in Christ and we are rich in him as the royal family of God. So we've covered that and there's also the idea of we got into uh, some key things that I brought out. We must know what human good is and evil. You know what the difference is between good and evil? What's the difference between human good and evil and sin? Are evil and sin the same? We've covered this before. And so this is why we must be students of the word of God. You should have notes paper, jotting it down and recognizing that this is stuff that because we are doing it for God, we have to be at our utmost best. We can't have a lackadaisical attitude anymore. We've got to get on the horn and get busy. I'm telling you, I, I was telling the Bible studies recently, I'm, I'm a little concerned with what I'm seeing all around us. Uh, with Jim Myers, just spoke, he spoke at National Capital Bible Church today and last week. And the tension in Ukraine is still at an all-time high. People are moving from place to place, country to country, find, trying to find a place to stay. Where are people going? These are thousands among thousands of people who are homeless now. You think homelessness is bad in California? Check out Ukraine. Check out what's happening there. I have a picture of a missile that went through a house and the tip is landed on top of a crib, a baby's crib, and you think you have problems. I say all this because with the message that we heard today with Jim Myers, it's, it's a strong reminder that I think our country, our world is going through severe divine discipline. And when we turn our noses up at God, he's gonna pour out his wrath slowly but surely it's going to be sprinkled in certain locations and those who are pivots those who are for the for the lord for god are going to be able to bless those who you know by association and that's what we're going to learn in just a moment as far as the message is concerned so let me just cover a few more things here and then we'll go right into evil remember we talked about there's two ways of thinking there's human viewpoint and divine viewpoint you and i must adopt the divine viewpoint whatever your age is if you're 50 if you're 38 if you're 65 you have 65 years of divine viewpoint experience you have to have you have to amass something similar to that as far as time logged in in the word of god so that you will move from human viewpoint to divine viewpoint. You must inculcate Bible doctrine on a regular basis. It doesn't come easily. It doesn't come naturally. In fact, the command is study and show yourself the proof. If it's optional, God would not mandate it. If, God, if it's optional, God would not command it. But it is not optional. It is a direct command. And so I'm saying as a church, we need to get extremely busy more now than last year or the year before. Why? Because we're getting closer to the rapture of the church. We're going to be out of here. You think it's empty now? You watch in just a moment. It's going to be empty. There's nobody going to be in that building anymore because we're going to be taken up into the sky and we're going to be high-fiving each other and saying, praise God, this is finally happening. This is the rapture of the church. But there's going to be a shedding of tears, the scripture says. He will wipe away every tear. There will be no more sorrow, no more pain. He will wipe away all tears. Why? I think part of it is we're going to be cr crying tears of joy and at the same time, tears of sadness. Those people we left, including family, because we're too afraid to speak to our family members because we don't want to ruin the relationship. Ruin the relationship as far as give it a shot, give it a chance. Run the risk of being embarrassed by your family member or friends. It doesn't matter. Give it a shot because that's the grace policy. You know 
that God is going to one day judge the world and we need to be at our best. This is all incorporated with the subject of evil. So a couple more things here. So we talked about divine viewpoint and human viewpoint. And so now let's go into our study here on evil. Follow with me on the top here. So evil includes social action, restriction of human freedom, the greater good, distortion of law to solve social and economic problems, interference of government and business and free enterprise. Governments trying to dip their fingers in everything and messing everything up for people. It's a shame. So who's the originator of evil? Of course, it's Satan. Evil originated and existed before human history, before Adam and Eve even. The means by which it was transmitted from previous creature existence to human history is Satan himself. The origin of evil is Satan's genius to devise a system to oppose God. When we assemble together, it's to worship God. It's to render him glory and honor. But Satan is in the business of opposing his system. So when you come to church, you when you're shaving and you're getting ready to go to church, don't think for a moment that Satan is, is not going to try to have you stay home so that you won't get into the word of God. You won't have fellowship. You won't sing songs that would render him glory and honor with your voices. We have a worship team that pulls together consistently as best as they can to bring God honor and glory. And we studied together Second Chronicles where Jehoshaphat, the way he won was he had a worship team go before his team and they were snuffed out three to one. They had three uh, military armies against his one. And because God saw the faith of Jehoshaphat and his people, they marched forward and they were singing praises to God. And guess what? By the time they got over the bend, they wiped each other out. They knifed each other's throat. They killed each other. So Jehoshaphat was able to collect all the goods. They were able to come back home and they had all the spoils and splendor. They took it all home. So we have a worship team that consistently meets together and does a fantastic job. I wish I was there to sing with you all, but um, I can't sing anyways. But you know, we have that's another reason. That's one of several reasons why we should be meeting. Don't think just because I'm not there, we can't meet. No, you go because it's still being transmitted through the monitors. You're still getting the teaching no matter what. And if it's something that can be done at home, we might as well just stay at home, but it can't be. The scripture says not to forsake the assembling of saints. So evil originated in the angelic creation in the greatest creature to ever come from the hand of God. Who is that? The greatest creature was the Lucifer himself, Satan. Satan controls most of Christianity through his cosmic system or world system. The thing that makes people function in the cosmic or world system is arrogance. Satan's plan is related to beating Christ to the millennium with his own attempt to produce a perfect world. He's trying to beat Jesus Christ to the millennium by winning as many people to himself, by keeping everybody so fixated on material things, pleasures of life, the details of life, everything else except God. Talking about everybody behind everyone's back, just focusing on just getting what he wants. Division, dividing people so that when he can go before the throne room of God, he can say, did you see what that person was saying behind his back, behind her back? That all is going to be a part of the tension between the war, the angelic conflict between God himself and Satan. That's been ongoing. And you and I are in the, in the limelight right now. All the angels, both elect and fallen, are watching us. They're looking at you fascinated that you're sitting there in your chairs, looking up at a monitor and saying, why? But as they start to see and realize that it's between their boss, God, and Satan, the one who tried to persuade the other angels, but they stayed with God, they realize, okay, God is answering the devil by using these puny people, us. 
Did you know that? That you are there not because of your own choice. You are there by an act of God's sovereignty. You who are listening online, you who are seated right there, your existence is because of the grace of God and the sovereignty of God interlocked together. And he said, yes, I want Mick there. I want Mitch there. I want Winston there. I want all of you there. And he's saying, you guys are going to answer the accusation that Satan is challenging me with, that it's not fair. I'm going to use you as the body of Christ to show him and, and his peons that he's clearly in the wrong. Clearly in the wrong. This is what we've been covering thus far in our Tuesday night Bible class for the angelic conflict under the subject of angelic conflict. So Satan's plan always looks good, always looks good to the ones who are oblivious to God's plan. Because if Satan can get you to feel good, and if you're led by your feelings mostly, he's got you. That's the reason why people say, I don't know how I got caught up in this mess. I never did this before. I never acted like this before. And now you got duped into it because if you're just bouncing around from one place to the next, and the only barometer that determines right or wrong for you is your feelings. I don't feel he's right. I don't think she's doing this right. And you don't have a foundational grid in place that's rooted in doctrine. How do you know you're even consistent with his word if you don't have doctrine in place? That has to be the place to compare it to. That has to be the truth that it will validate whether or not what you are doing is right or wrong. It can't be based on feelings. Feelings is a core determining factor for distinguishing right from wrong. Doctrinal conclusions about evil. A couple things here, and then we're going to look at a passage that I, um, if you got the email, how fellowship and sound doctrine will protect you from evil. That's the title of the message, although it's really in a continuation of the basic Bible doctrine series that we're looking at, but I'm going to prove to you and show you in the word. <clears throat> Look what Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 says. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled. Do you want skilled workers or unskilled workers? If, if you were the boss, you would probably want skilled workers, wouldn't you? You want skilled doctors and physicians to work on your back as they perform surgery or unskilled? Someone who just kind of learned from YouTube videos. You would want someone skilled. So notice what it says here. Everyone who partakes only of milk, the only the soft basic truths. God loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves me, praise God, and God is good all the time. And if that's all you are good for before you lose all your attention and you can't sit there anymore because you just can't discipline yourself to give God one hour of your time when he's given you not only physical life, but eternal life. If you can't discipline yourself for the one hour at minimum, or at least for your life, you don't have a balanced understanding of who God is. You're arrogant. You're more focused on your comfortability than on God's glory and honor. And that doesn't match. We're commanded to prioritize him. That's my job is to show you what he says so that we can all in one voice, one movement, do what we can to please him because he's worthy. We no longer have to worry about our eternal destiny because he took care of that. So notice in Hebrews 5, continuing on, verse 14. So there's milk is for the unskilled, but notice what it says for the solid. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That means mature. Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So because they've used their senses, they've been consistent with doctrine. They've been able to use the word of God to discern good and evil solid food belongs to them. Whereas the other person on the flip side of that, they can't hang. 
They, it's too much for them. They can't they can't discipline themselves to stay. You know what? It's it's Sunday afternoon. I can't go to church today because I have so many things to do. Prioritize God. Let me tell you, you must prioritize God. You're hearing it from me. Am I bullying you? No. Is he worthy? Yes. Yes and yes. He must be priority and preeminent in your life. If not, if you go sidestep him, there are multiple passages that will suggest and tell us clearly that the disciplining hand of God will come, which is why I have to do the uncomfortable business of speaking the truth in love. I don't say this for popularity reasons. I do it because I care and I want every person who is listening to this online and in person in the church there to recognize that God must be before everything else, including, I repeat, including family. God must be preeminent. Otherwise, you idolize family before God. That's idolatry. And that is a big no-no. You should never do that. Evil exists in the thought pattern of the soul. Evil and degeneracy start with a thought. It takes a lot of doctrine to reject evil. The Christian walk is the only real protection against evil. Did you hear what I put there in the last line? The Christian walk, your walk with God, is the only real protection against evil. That's, And I'm going to segue into what I mean by that and use an example in just a moment. Look at what Matthew says. But if your eye is bad, Jesus speaking, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It's in the context of serving God and money, God in something else, God in self, putting something else in place of God. If your eye is bad, then everything else will be bad. If you take in only things that relate to self instead of God, instead of looking at him, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't, you, you've got to prioritize God before anything else, God and money. God has to be first, God in mat before material things, God before family, God before everything else. If you do that, then great is the light that's in you. Then you are going to have constant blessings that is matched up with Matthew 6.33, which is what we saw last week. You'll recall, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Look at the birds and look at the lilies. My message on the antidote to worry. Now he says, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Mental attitude arrogance is anything related to preoccupation with self to the point of sin, human good, or evil. It is satisfaction with self, yourself. Arrows going this way instead of upwards. Arrows instead of going upwards, giving him praise and glory and giving your him your undivided attention. Arrows are going this way. I'm uncomfortable. I'm too tired. I'm hungry. I don't feel like it. When you become the priority over God, that becomes a problem and that's evil, according to scripture. It is satisfaction with self and dissatisfaction with others and with God. Negative volitions, arrogance, is related to preoccupation with self and causes apathy towards doctrine. I don't want to go anymore. He's going to talk about salvation again. You know, don't ever be arrogant like that. Don't ever say, I know it all. No, you don't. You don't know it all. I've done seminary training, and I know enough to know that there is so much more to unpack if we had the time. I think I gave you this example that in one of the classes, the professor took one verse and he said, I want you to find 10 observations on Acts 1-8. This, the class came back the following week and they came up with, I think, 50. And then uh, the professor said, okay, good. Go home and do the same assignment. Come back next week. Tell me what else you find. Just on one verse, find things in Acts 1 8 Acts chapter 1 verse 8 he did this several times 
And then they found, I think, 5,000 things in the one verse. 5,000 things in the one verse. Now, you might be thinking, well, oh, my gosh, that's too much. What? You know what? Yeah, maybe it is too much. But it goes to show that if you are going to put the time in and invest the time and look, you will find things that you may not have seen the first, second, or third time around. Is that important? Yes, it falls under the category of obeying Matthew 4.4. 4. Um, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Moving on. Conspiracy arrogance to follow follows inst follows institutions institutional arrogance and results in conspiracy to overthrow the purpose policy or authority of an organization basically you get people that huddle together and talk what should we do what should we do that's conspiracy arrogance that's disciplinary that calls for disciplinary action from god himself when people huddle together and talk about, uh, what should we do? We should we should do something about this. When it goes against policy or purpose or authority of an organization, that's called conspiracy arrogance. That's under the banner of evil. So these are things that we need to know. Now we're moving on to um, the message of how does doctrine and fellowship protect you from evil? The believer in fellowship is protected from evil. Satan wants you to drop your guard and go negative towards doctrine. He wants you to stay away from the word of God, just like he did in Genesis. He told Eve, did God really say that? It's always an assault against the word of God. Look at the verses that I'm showing you here before we move forward. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, notice on the bottom here. The blue lettering is going to be verses that relate to fellowship, applied Bible doctrine, or, and God working behind the scenes. The words in green, no fellowship, no doctrine. It's Satan's work. It's Satan's policy, a.k.a. evil. Let's take a look at a passage that I'm sure we're familiar with. Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. <clears throat> Genesis 37, 3 to 4. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. <clears throat> but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the others, his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So notice two things here. There's two problems here in the green in verse three and four. Israel, also known as Jacob, it was used interchangeably because God wrestled with Jacob and changed his name. So Israel loved Joseph more than all his other children because he was the son of his old age, because he was he was the last son in his elderly age. So he favored, there's favoritism going on, basically. But then notice, he also made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. I'm sure this is ringing a bell to some of you now. In 5-7, Joseph had a dream. Remember this? He told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more in the dream. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. There, were, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheep arose and stood straight upright. And indeed, your sheep stood all around and bowed to my sheep. So what's going on here? This is a dream. They hated him even more, verse 5. They, the sheaves here are standing one stood up his and the rest of theirs stood all around and bowed down to his sheep do you see the picture here this is a dream that joseph had so again blue is fellowship as we move through the various verses here so god is behind it green it's evil it's 
the policy of Satan. <clears throat> no God. His brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? Is that what you're saying? Huh? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another one, another dream, and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. I had that, you think that's bad? Check this one out. This time, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Say what? So he told it to his father and his brother. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Remember, the father favored him, remember? Gave him, made him a tunic, colorful tunic. And that was his favorite because he was he had him when he was an older age. He told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Notice that at the very end of verse 11. His dad kept it to himself. He kept it in the back of his mind. For some reason, that just stood out. He just said, okay, I, my son, is, this is my favorite here, but he's going a little too far. The blue is God's on your side. Applied doctrine, you're in fellowship. You're in good standing with God. Evil is green. So now, 14 to 16. Then he said to, him, said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent them out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. And a certain man, notice it's in blue now, a certain man out of the blue comes up. And there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, say, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. Who sent them there? The dad. So the man said, they have departed from here. And for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. That's in blue. What does blue stand for? God is in fellowship. Uh, Joseph is in fellowship with, with God. And he's obeying his father, even though he knows that his father was ticked off at him and his whole family's ticked off at him. And he said, go look for your brothers. Make sure they're okay. Come bring back word to me. Tell me how they're doing. Now notice in verse 18. Now when they, who's they? Let's look at the rest of the passage here. When they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to what? Kill him. There's evil, jealousy, anger, bitterness, irritability. Then they said to one another, look at this dream. Look at this. This dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now. What? What do they want to do to his brother? Kill him. Cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Let's see what his dreams will do now. So they wanted to kill him. Who did? The brothers. See the evil working behind the scenes here? But notice in verse 17, the man happens to be there who found Joseph looking for his brothers. And so he, he gave him a, a hint as to where they were. He heard them speaking. Look, look at verse 17. They have departed from here. I have heard them say... Let us go to Dothan. So out of the blue, this man happened to be at the right place at the right time to know the brothers that he's looking for as per his father's instructions were going to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers. And guess what? Now the evil. They conspired against him to kill him. 18, 17 to 20. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic that his father made him, remember? The tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit 
and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. Notice how the Holy Spirit is very specific. He wants us to know that there was no water in it. So he didn't drown. And possibly he wants us to know he didn't drown. There's nothing to drink and consume to keep him hydrated because you can live longer on water than with, you can live longer if you have access to water, but you can't live long um, if you don't have water. If you have food, doesn't matter. Water is the preferred out of the two if you had to pick one or the other. Verse 25, they sat down to eat a meal. Who was they? The brothers. Then they lifted their eyes. Notice I put it in blue. They lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming by, coming from the Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. Green. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let us not let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brothers listen. So one of the brothers said, Well, you know what? He is part of us. He is our brother, right? Let's not kill him. Let's just make money so we can play macho. So we could go to the to Vegas and we can play games there. They wanted money. There's this is all in green. So, again, no fellowship, Satan's work, policy. We're seeing the green contrasted with the blue. Verse 39, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master of the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. You see that in verse three? He the somehow the master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, he put under his authority. All that in blue. Do you see the shift from green to blue? You see how it's sporadic and interspersed in there? How God used an individual to point him to where his brothers were? This is where we're going to stop now so that I can open it up for some Q&A if you have any questions. But this, I want you to see when you have doctrine at your side and you're using it, you're putting God first. You're obeying him first. And we're, we're not going to, we, we don't have the time to go through all the things that he's gone through. But you remember his wife, Potiphar's wife, came on to him. Apparently, he's one of three people in the new, in the Bible who is called handsome. More on that next week. But for now, I'd like to open it up for any questions, just in case some of you might have any questions. So I think we might have a, um, a phone nearby. So let me see if I can do this one. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Karen. Okay. Well, we have the cell phone working. I can bring up. We have one. Hold on. No, no questions. Well, hold on.
I can see you guys there. I just, uh... hi, Sarah. Hi, Arnie. <laughs> Can you hear us? A little bit. Can you try it again? I'll raise up my volume now. <laughs> Did you make it louder? Yeah. So just, are you using a phone there? Yes. Okay. What's the question? Oh, it's kind of uh, muffled. I'm so sorry. I can't really hear that. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Karen. So the question is, when you talk about the The last part cut out. I know something about, I heard the part about killing. <laughs> I spoke right into it. So can we do it here? Can you hear me here, Pastor Freddie? Yes, I can hear you there. Okay, so the question is if Judah, it talks about um, him with the son uh -huh. or being the brother. Uh huh. Why is that in green? Why is it in green? When it says it's its own flesh and blood, why is that in green? Um, I'll have to see what, what I'll have to backtrack on that slide. I don't have, um, I can't do that without losing you here. So maybe I'll look it up and then answer it. Uh, sorry, I have to answer that next week. Winston, can you can you speak, Winston? Oh, it's muted. Yeah, it's very faint. Now the mic is muted. All right. We'll just have to use this one. Okay. I know you're you're asking one of the questions on um, why is it green? I just don't know which slide we're looking at. Sorry. Well, how about this? Just so that we um, we will try to come up with a another system for asking questions so that we can I can hear it better. Maybe we'll just uh, have to maybe maybe you can just send it to me or something. Would that be okay, guys? Yes, that'll work. Okay, so why don't we close in a word of prayer? And um, sorry, I wasn't wasn't able to make out the question there, but um, if someone could send me the the question via text or email, I'll gladly answer it by next week since we didn't get to finish it today, anyways. So good chat. So we'll do that. Let, for now, I'll close in a word of prayer so we could be sensitive to the time. Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to examine your word. And it's the joy when we can look at the passage together and see that there are things there that maybe we haven't seen before. And so I pray, Lord, that as we look into this, that you would help us to see the sovereign hand of our Lord at work, that in spite of things going negative, you always cause things to go right. You cause all things to work together for good. And so we thank you, Father, for this time. 
And for those who continue to assemble together, I am pleased with the fact that um, they're all interested in growing in their relationship with you and we're facilitating this, Lord. And so I hope this pleases you. We do this um, in spite of the time difference for me and for them, we do everything we can to maximize exposure to your word because we know that the solutions to life are always anchored in your word, never apart from your word. And so I pray that uh, we continue to have a strong desire to know you more each and every day through your word. Uh, we're living in some really crazy times now where what's right is now wrong, what's wrong is now called right, just as the Bible has prophesied. And so we're living in those strange times now, Father, and we're not even sure of what truth is anymore. It just is up in the air, just up for grabs. What you think is true is true, and what I think is true may be true. It just now depends on how our perspective and how we view things based on our emotions and how we feel. So I pray, Lord, that we would be steadfast in the word and recognize that uh, there is absolute truth that's found in scripture. It's no longer popular today. And I can see that. I can see how the enemy is constantly working to discourage all believers from all levels to stay away from your word because he knows that that's where the power is. So thank you, Father, for hearing us. I ask now that you would bless those who would assemble together around bread and allow them to be nourished by the food that they're going to partake in. And we ask and pray all of these things through Christ's matchless name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.